Unfortunately for me, Radical Heights is no longer the most pre-alpha thing I have ever played. That now belongs to Star Citizen. If we were to compare Star Citizen to another form of media, I would pick Guns N' Roses' Chinese Democracy album. With the modifier being that every couple of weeks, Axl Rose will release a live broadcast from the recording studio asking everyone for more money because now they want to do a radio play and they've decided that they need a full symphonic orchestra to be on the album too. In case you're living under a rock that is in turn living at the bottom of the ocean and you're constantly complaining about spin-off DLCs, let me give you a quick crash course on what Star Citizen was, is, and what it might be. Star Citizen was first announced as a Kickstarter project in late 2012 by Cloud Imperium Games founder Chris Roberts. Roberts had previously worked on games like Freelancer, which seems to be what Star Citizen is supposed to be once upon a time, and in addition, Roberts has an extensive history making games and movies, including the only good Nicolas Cage movie. Star Citizen kicked up a storm of hype and flew clear past all of its funding goals and eventually grew out of the Kickstarter platform to host all its funding on its own website. Fast forward nearly six years past several controversies, blunders, and other such missteps, and you've had an alarmingly small amount of progress made in the time frame that it takes for your average AAA game to go from concept to completion. There's a lot of controversy around this game, but there's also a lot of diehard fans that will defend this thing to the death. Star Citizen pulled in over $30 million last year, despite an astounding lack of progress in the face of the off-the-wall feature ideas, some of which were even cancelled only to be brought back again a couple years later in a half-baked format. The sad thing is, this fandom is allowing this game to keep existing long after it passed the point of no return. After going over nearly every aspect of all the stuff going around about Star Citizen, including its development, I have reason to believe that we're never going to see Star Citizen happen, at least not in the way that it was initially pitched to the people. It is very possible that the development of this game has hit a point of no return where no matter what they do, they are not making enough progress to conceivably get this game out on time and in a manner that it was initially pitched to us, and it's also very possible that due to all the hype they have swirling around them, Cloud Imperium Games has hasn't even realized this. Now, in addition to my own opinions, I've brought on some friends and colleagues, the Yamix, uh, sure? and Mandalore Games. Thanks for having me. I'm glad I don't have to make another video on this for a while. And now one last declaration before we get into all the major points here. Believe me, get your popcorn. This is going to be a wild ride. I am not goon fud. I am not anti-star citizen. I am not pro-star citizen. I am strictly neutral on the matter and I am just presenting what I have found based on my research. Heck, I didn't even know what the goon fud was until I was accused of being it in my previous video where I thought I found something really cool about star citizen. Let's do this. The first major area we're going to touch on here is Cloud Imperium Games' loss of focus when it comes to developing Star Citizen, and how I'm not even sure what this game is supposed to be about anymore, even though the pitch was clear, I guess. So the question becomes, I guess, what is Star Citizen supposed to be? Star Citizen is a merger of Freelancer and Wing Commander that is somehow becoming an MMO. Very well put, but let's also ask, what is Star Citizen right now exactly? Oh, a pipe dream, essentially. A feature creep filled project that seems to really go nowhere at the moment. Whenever you think it's progressing forward, there's always something new being introduced on top of that. And so it goes on and on and on. But factually, Star Citizen is ostensibly a project to make a game, or two, or who knows anymore. As of current standing, Star Citizen at least is known for one thing, properly. And that's the most crowdfunded funding gathered for a project in gaming. That alone, this thing succeeds in. For sure. But don't be fooled, it's not a game. At least, not yet. Even though official media or official store can make it seem different. And therein lies one of the biggest issues of Star Citizen's loss of focus so far. There is a huge disparity over what it states to be and what it actually has become over the last five and a half years. Over the years, Star Citizen has been in development for so long that it's blown past all the deadlines it's set and has become this amalgamous 
thing that, well, hopefully it'll become what we thought it was in the future. But I think one of the big things behind why it got this way is the way that Star Citizen chooses to get its funding. Now, initially, the idea of using crowdfunding to fund the development as you go by selling ships sounds like a great idea. But fast forward five and a half years and we realize, wow, that was actually a terrible idea. You see, let's say you run out of money and you're like, oh no, we're running out of money. We need to get more money. Well, we can just make another ship, which... To be fair, some of these ships were likely ships that they were already planning to make in the first place, so why not? But now this creates the issue of you have a bit more work piled onto your already very large workload that is so big that you couldn't quite do it with your funding you had, and that's an entire ship. All the modeling, all the physics, all the cute little quirks and features that it seems a cottage industry of YouTubers touring the ships has sprung up around, and on top of that, some of these ships will have a lot of variants you need to make, so that is a considerable amount of work you need. Well, yes, you will get a pretty penny for allowing people to pledge for that ship. Now you've got more work, so it comes back around. Oh no, we have so much work that we're not sure we're gonna be able to cover it all with the funding we have. I know, let's put another ship up for pledging. And then they've been stuck on this hamster wheel. They keep on selling ships to cover the funds, but then they run out of funds because of all the work they've created for themselves, so they have to sell more ships. And it just keeps on going into a recursive loop. This gets things really off track when it comes to the major features of the game, because because, well, while I don't know too much about development, I have a feeling that developing a single ship is a lot easier than developing an entire feature. And while we have seen a ship that is made for salvage ops, the uh, Reclamator, I believe, we still haven't seen salvage ops yet. And uh, nobody's sure when, even after 3.2. An additional place where we can see Cloud Imperium Games go down the rabbit hole is their own YouTube channel, which is full of just, oh wow, that's a lot of exertion you're putting into this one thing. These videos are very well done. They put out two or three a week, and it's evident that they've got a full-on crew and a professional editor for all these things to make sure that they can keep the hype train flowing. These videos certainly talk a whole bunch, but they all sort of boil down into three major categories. Talking to the developers, where the devs sidestep major questions, or often give an answer that starts with the phrase, well, we're working on... Two, a glossy spotlight designed to get you pledging on a half-finished ship. Examples include all the behind-the-scenes stuff with major actors from Squadron 42, and a fully-fledged Top Gear parody complete with Jeremy Clarkson impersonator. The third and final category of these videos is just sort of half-baked lore stuff. These, uh... I could take them or leave them. I'm not going to condemn them, but I'm not going to extol them. What the real issue about these videos is, is this is a lot of resources to dump into a YouTube channel. And frankly, I can't help but be reminded of Red 5, the studio that tried to make the game Firefall, and all the money they dumped into that ridiculous YouTube channel that they had. Another place where you can see this loss of focus is the major updates themselves. A lot of stuff gets added in the notes, but not a lot of stuff is actually done. Yeah, we've got new outposts and those ships you pledge 50 bucks for a while ago are now something you can spawn in game, but not a lot of headway was really made until 3.2, and even then that wasn't a lot of headway to begin with. There's still a lot of stuff that needs to be done that seems to get consistently ignored, like animation clipping, menu simply just not working unless you press the buttons like 5,000 times, and the list goes on. Like, we don't even have to bring up frame rate, but we will later when we're talking about the gameplay itself. To be fair, they did add quests in, quote unquote, but these quests aren't exactly fun when all that we've got is, hey, go over to this random plot of space and maybe there will be an enemy there for you to kill. And on top of all this, these updates bring their own sets of problems. New bugs, changing over to the engine and development system, and that new set of bugs. It seems that everything is just another can of worms. And on top of everything, this all happens painfully slow given the time that Cloud Imperium Games has had to do with this. Remember, it's been nearly six years. And at this point, it really feels like everything Cloud Imperium Games does is an elaborate show to tell the backers, look at how much we're doing and all this stuff. You've got the YouTube channel, you've got various events, you've got all these things. Somewhere at the 100 million mark, I really think that Cloud Imperium Games lost their way and now are spending so much effort into trying to make it look like they're putting in a serious effort. Which to be fair, stuff does eventually get done, but it's so painfully slow that a lot of things are starting to become valid. A lot of people initially said that 
Star Citizen was going to be out in 2020 as a sort of insult, as a sort of disparaging thing. But now 2020 is considered a really optimistic estimate about when we might see Star Citizen. But for the time being, we just get that big show of look how much effort we're putting in and we're getting entire planets with not much to do with them. Stations and outposts that are completely empty. Ships that are missing half their animations. And the list goes on. A byproduct of this loss of focus, or possibly its root cause, as there's a bit of a chicken and the egg scenario going on between the two, is Star Citizen's feature creep. I'm gonna go ahead and let Mandalore Gaming introduce this part. The primary issue that I think Star Citizen is facing is that they do have feature creep. Even now, I don't think they have anything really locked down as far as what they want in the release version or what it is. Every time I check back with it, they're adding new stuff, or they're thinking about new stuff to add, or they're putting in ships that weren't in the original stretch goals at all. So, uh, stuff is all over the place. And it certainly is all over the place. Since Star Citizen's initial funding, there's been a multitude of stretch goals that, while could be considered feature creep, were originally announced ideas. There's been the addition, removal, and even re-addition of various features and game modes that heavily dilute the resources Cloud Imperium Games has. Let's first take a look at Citizen Marine because that's a great example of feature creep gone wild. I kind of get a vibe from Citizen Marine that it initially started with someone at a meeting saying, hey, wouldn't it be really cool if after somebody shot you down, you could pull out a sidearm you had in your cockpit and try to fire off a few shots at them to get some last minute revenge. And everyone was like, yeah, that's really cool. And that eventually snowballed into heavy weaponry and pirates raiding ships and eventually a full blown shooter mode that they outsourced to the guys that made Sonic boom for some reason. Yeah, that, okay, cool. We'll really dig deep into Citizen Marine later when we're talking about the quality of the games themselves, but a good way to brush over it for the sake of feature creep is Citizen Marine is a shooter mode in a video game meant to be about flying spaceships. And there's really no redeeming gimmicks or qualities to it. And it really, 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 really needs polish. It was so unpolished that even for a while it got canceled, but then they decided maybe a year or so later, nah, we'll bring that back. And here we are, it's still in the game and if you're willing to pledge money on a ship, you can play it for yourself. Out of all the game modes and features in Star Citizen, Citizen Marine was the one that I could stomach the least amount of time. I had to force myself to play enough rounds to get a decent amount of footage for this game. Citizen Marine also demonstrates a wonderful side effect of the feature creep being the neglect of basic features. How are you going to be getting in your ship when you're already clipping and rubber banding all over the place, but now you've got half a dozen dudes shooting at you for some reason? All that's gonna do is pour a big dollop of kerosene on the garage fire that just found its way to the dryer lid. Another example of blatant feature creep is now Star Citizen is going to allow you to buy plots of land to do something on. And it hasn't been explicitly stated what you can do on it, but you can still pay money for it. There's a multitude of things that they could do with this. Maybe you can build military-esque outposts. Maybe you can make yourself a sort of fuel station. You can maybe license out the Chevron name or Royal Dutch Shell. I don't know. Maybe when they finally get the salvaging in and they have the reclamator scooping up shipwrecks, you can bring all the wrecks down to your plot of land and have yourself a space scrapyard because that sounds fun. Who knows, it could be fun if like you're into salvaging. I'm not one to judge, just uh, it seems really vague and considering that the salvaging is the only overtly planned feature they've made since I haven't heard anything about base building or terraforming, it seems like there's going to be a lot of space scrapyards if that's the route they're gonna go. But who knows, maybe we'll be able to have like Citizen Arco where you can set up yourself a little corner store that sells space e-cigs and energy drinks so you can uh, pay for another ship. I don't know. It's that's that's the whole point of it is what are we going to do with this land? They just said, hey, you can buy land in this game. But aside from implications that we've been able to derive by ourselves, they haven't really formally stated what you're going to be able to do with this land. You know what else? I mean, Charlatan doesn't know is that you don't actually buy land from these guys. So here's what you get. You buy a land claiming tool that basically will be a planet celebrant. Raw is it that you'll plant someone and then get back to some rondo registration desk to claim this spot as yours. If you're not the first back, tough luck you. 
but what does the claimed land give you? Basically, base insurance. Yes, that's right, the thing that got Metal Gear mocked by is present in Star Citizen 2. But instead of actually buying insurance, what you buy is <laughs> insurance papers from an insurance company that may or may not exist. Every time I think about something like this, it makes me question if it's actually real, because no one would be so inept to make something like this. Could they? And then there's Squadron 42. While Squadron 42 was initially one of the stretch goals, including the A-list cast that was going to be voicing the main characters, it is a great example of feature creep just out of control. Squadron 42 was one of the original promises for the extended goals of the Kickstarter, and it sounds great for a person like me that would really like to see a return to the space sim games like Free Space 2 and Descent where you fly around in your ship and shoot stuff, and there happens to be a nice little story going on in the background. It's an excuse to work on those shooty gun bits from Citizen Marine, and it's also a great way to lay down some plot and world building for your MMO counterpart, Star Citizen. That makes it a shame that Squadron 42 weeks of overspending, poor planning, and general feature creep. Between all the glossy promo spots on their YouTube channel and the A-list dream team of actors they've wrangled together, and all the ambitious set pieces we've seen for it's evident that Chris Roberts is treating this more like the summer blockbuster he never quite got to make than a single player game counterpart to his MMO. The game's synopsis and general features really reads like the sort of dream sci-fi production that every other producer, director, actor, and food service employee in the greater LA area wants to make someday. And it's very convenient for Chris Roberts that he has a hundred million dollars laying around now to make that dream a reality, and also a playable video game. A lot of AAA games get made fun of for having major A-list actors in their games, but only for a very small part, just long enough to get noticed, but definitely not long enough to have a lasting effect on the game. This is in part because of the way SAG-AFTRA has its workday regulations and its pay rates that that's usually the best way they can go about it for a video game game. Usually these people are cumulatively in the games for 11 or 22 minutes, which is about as much as you can accomplish in a sag after regulated half day or day, being two hours and four hours of booth work time respectively before some pretty intense overtime starts to kick in. And then once things like set crew, people to operate the machinery that's recording the body movements and actions of the actors, catering, safety, etc. Once that all adds up, you've got yourself quite a pretty penny for some voice acting and mocap work and multiply that by you're getting A-list celebrities like Gary Oldman, Jillian Anderson, Mark Hamill to be the people in your game for the main characters and you've got yourself quite the money pit. And yes, this is something they initially said was going to be a thing for the Kickstarter, but that what they asked for to get, make that happen was way too little. And this might have been something that spurred on the Cloud Imperium Games team to climb into that hamster wheel of selling ships to pay for development costs, which means they need to develop more and now they gotta sell more ships and now blink and it's been nearly six years and we've only seen an hour vertical slice of Citizen Marine. And then on top of these things, there's also the matter of things that are sort of implied to be going to be made through the flavor text of some of the ship they're selling. There's gonna be exploring, there's going to be like full on capital ship fighting with some of the ships that they're selling. There's all sorts of stuff and it generally leads to a sort of feeling of distrust at times, which uh, I'm gonna let Yamex tell you about. It seems that Chris, or the company in general, has the mentality of a magpie. They see some new feature being put in a game, and wow, we need to implement it in Star Citizen as well. Unless there's something more sinister going on as they reach one goal, well, not to stop the gravy train, let's announce another feature, and then another, and another, so we just keep going on and on and on. While the nature of the feature creep does lend credence to that sort of line of thought, there is also another thing to consider, which is the next major topic. The lack of any serious oversight on Cloud Imperium games or any sort of accountability either.
A lot of the problems that are plaguing Star Citizen can all be traced back to the lack of any serious oversight on Cloud Imperium Games or any of its subsidiaries. There's no strong leadership role to guide a team in a direction that gets the game stable and ship. And while yes, Chris Roberts is the CEO on paper, according to all their corporation filings, he doesn't act like a chief executive officer. He acts like a creative director which is in practice what he seems to be. And that makes him a creative director that happens to be his own boss, eliminating any oversight for him. And don't give me or anyone else that line about how the backers are the boss, because let's be blunt here, the backers can't suspend him for two months without pay or formally demote him or any of that stuff. They can just whine on the internet and that's not an effective tool at managing a company. Typically how things are in your corporate hierarchy is above the employees there are managers of major projects, say the manager of a very ambitious game. And then above them you'll have directors or maybe a group of vice presidents. And in turn, above them, you'll have a CEO that runs the entire show. And above the CEO, you'll have a board of directors and or shareholders who are often one in the same who want to make as much profit as possible. The issue arises in Star Citizen that Chris Roberts is the CEO as well as the creative manager. He is his own boss's boss. And on top of that, there's no one above that position because where a board of directors and shareholders there would be, there's just an endless stream of Kickstarter money with limited accountability, if any at all. As the lead developer, he does his job well. He does make the most crazy, awesome stuff he can think of and possibly make with all his computer toys. And that is a good way to draw in funding, whether through purchase or investment. But he's also one of the primary corporate managers of Cloud Imperium Games, which means he's also supposed to be holding the creative types accountable, aka setting and holding holding people to deadlines, targeting concerns, budgeting things, making roadmaps so that there's an actual plan to get the game finished. However, he neglects all of that as CEO. Anytime there seems to be any sort of time or money issue facing Cloud Imperium games, the answer always goes back to that hamster wheel of, oh, we can just sell another ship and that'll get us all the money we need, which in turn gets us all the time we need. A result of never having to worry about time, money, or your boss yelling at you because you are your own boss is that there are no constraints on Star Citizen as a whole and all creative projects need constraint or else they're crap. We've talked about this before in the Radical Heights video and we're going to talk about it again now. In most large corporation based development houses that usually means that there's some executive who holds a fiduciary duty to the shareholders to make the game money. So they're going to put the screws on the creative types to get the game out and get it out fast and in a presentable manner so that everyone makes money and their duty is fulfilled. For indie types, it's paying the rent. If you don't make this game and you don't make it good, you're going to be living that starving artist stereotype and nobody actually wants to do that. Even jerks like me have constraints on their creative projects. If I don't eventually get this video out, my constraint is gonna be, oh darn it, I can't get groceries. And that's a big problem. Star Citizen has no constraint. And when you don't have to worry about deadlines, bills, or anything else that you might need to get your project out, you have no reason to get your project out. You can just sit around and tinker with it until the end of time. We can thank Kickstarter culture for this scenario which with a lot of games, Kickstarter culture happened. 2012 through 2015 was crazy with Kickstarter culture. And Star Citizen is Kickstarter culture at its most hyperbolic. Star Citizen's non-traditional funding system, which easily nets it tens of millions of dollars every year, is pretty much no strings attached at this point. Cloud Imperium Games isn't even on Kickstarter anymore, which means that Kickstarter can't pull a Scarp laser razor on CIG and not pay out on the grounds that there's no working prototype or product, and additionally, it's really easy to write off complaints from backers and demands for refunds as just angry trolls who will get shouted down by the evangelical backers anyway. News articles from any site or publication can be written off as clickbaiting. The only real constraint that Cloud Imperium Games was forced to acknowledge was when somebody was so upset about not being able to get a refund that they got their local district attorney involved. Other than that, it's no strings attached. Like I've been 
and hammering home again and again in the last five minutes. The biggest byproduct of this is that Cloud Imperium Games cannot keep a deadline to save their lives. Chris Roberts himself has come out and overtly said, please don't keep us to deadlines. Well, yeah, Mr. Roberts, that's supposed to be your job. Thanks to this lack of constraint and deadline, Star Citizen went from being a unique experiment in Kickstarter funding about a game that we would never see otherwise to having legitimate competition. Now, before I go off on this additional part of the tirade, let's bring in the voice of reason real quick. I think it's hard to compare to its competitors because of the business model they're taking with it and also because the game is, you know, nowhere close to being finished yet. I mean, Elite started very bare bones, and they've been adding more onto it, but they had, you know, they had the basic flight model and combat and all that. They've been expanding that out into adding stuff like multi-crew and going on planets, whereas Star Citizen needs to put in everything at once. And we saw with No Man's Sky how how much of a hurdle that was for them. The very nature of the game means that they need to develop it all at once, or else you have the issue that you had with the original Star Marine version where they outsourced it, and it wasn't porting over correctly into the main game and the systems they had there. So, I guess it's hard to compare. Thank you, Mandalore, that was very well said. However, Star Citizen has gone from having no real competition in any sense to having now a couple games that are vying for the top spot of being the online space sim that everyone wants to play. Take Elite Dangerous, for example. Elite originally was something that was riding on the coattails of Star Citizen. They had a Kickstarter right after Star Citizen did and they got funded. And while yes, Elite Dangerous was a few months late compared to the original stated deadline, you know what they did? They launched the game. Yes, not without controversy as they eventually realized, oh crap, we can't do this in a single player format, but you know what? You can play Elite and it functions. How about that? The Copycat Project, which I know is not exactly a fair statement to make because Elite was an existing space sim series that had previously talked about maybe using crowdfunding when the time was right, but the one riding on the coattails beat them to the punch. And on top of that, they've released expansions. They have completely expanded their game like in a non-traditional like expansion box set with the Thargoids. They've made new ships. They've made new updates. Elite is like an established game now and well under the time it took for Star Citizen to get to what? Alpha 3? Elite never had to worry about the serious problems that Star Citizen is having right now because they do have constraint and accountability to hold to. For instance, they didn't decide to sell every last little ship before the game launch and therefore their money was very finite. So they had to get the game out, even if it meant not being able to fulfill certain promises such as a single player player mode. And here we are in 2018 and nobody on earth is saying, hey, when are we going to get Elite Dangerous? It's been like six years. Why? Because it's out. You know what other starship game in a massive galaxy is making a fool of Star Citizen right now? No Man's Sky. I'm not even joking. Well, yes, No Man's Sky was just like Star Citizen, a massively overhyped project. And yes, Sean Murray did not do it any favors with his mouth. And yes, No Man's Sky had an absolutely disastrous embarrassment of a launch when everyone realized that this game was nowhere near what anyone said it was going to be. You know what else No Man's Sky has been able to do? Redeem itself. Since the disastrous launch in August of 2016, No Man's this guy has had two years to constantly fix what was wrong with it and what fell short. And you know what? If you look at the reviews, people are viewing it favorably now. And I played it myself as evidenced by the footage here. And you know, it's not as bad as anyone initially said when it launched. You don't wanna know why? Because they had the constraint. They had to get the game out, even if it meant that Sean Murray had written a bunch of checks with his mouth that his game could not cash. Now that there's not one, but two different Starship Sim games out there for people to play, we have to consider, all right, so what does Star Citizen bring to the table? Let's pose the question to somebody who plays a lot of those other games, like Elite. How do you think Star Citizen compares to its competitors and other games in similar style? Well, for one, those games probably are finished. And at this point, Star Citizen really only excels in the fact that you can interact with your ship slightly more than a few other specific competitors, and you have super high resolution textures. That is about it. To help you all better understand just how poorly this whole lack of deadline accountability thing has served Star Citizen, I'm going to start listing a bunch of things that have happened in Star Citizen's development period. Let's see. 
there's the entire Peter Jackson Hobbit trilogy. Donald Trump going from eccentric businessman to the leader of the free world. Also, approximately 200 mooches. The entire rise and fall of the YouTube personality Filthy Frank and Joji's eventual transition into being a musical artist full time. The Godzilla franchise went from a dead franchise to an American franchise, then back to a Japanese franchise, and then became a god-awful anime. Real-world space travel has made massive strides, including completely reusable booster stages on real-world rockets. And while we're on poor old musky boy, the brand Tesla went from really cool to that sketchy car that nobody really wants to buy anymore. Scott Cawthon has single-handedly produced eight Five Nights at Freddy's games, three novels, and secured a movie deal all by himself without having Kickstarter money. The Avengers were assembled, broken up in the Civil War, and then assembled again for the Infinity War. And meanwhile, the Spider-Man franchise was rebooted twice. Okay, I should probably stop now. I've got like two and a half pages of these, but you get the point. Okay, maybe one more. Mustangs went from fast and cool to fat and ugly to fast and cool again. Okay, there, we're done. I think you all see that the point I'm trying to make is the lack of oversight and accountability has led to the neglect of deadlines, effectively meaning that the entire world outside of evangelical fans has passed passed by Star Citizen and is still sitting there occasionally making the news when some ridiculous backer goal gets announced. We'll talk more about questionable actions later, but another thing we should talk about in relation to the lack of accountability is it's often smokescreened with non-achievements getting a lot of hoopla surrounding them. This circles back to that big show about how hard they're working, putting more effort into telling you about it than actually doing it, and we get a whole bunch of planets with nothing to really do on them, and empty space space stations. It's very reminiscent of like when you've got something really important to do, but then you sit down and say, oh, I should probably do this first. And you end up doing every task around you except the tasks that you actually need to do, which in this case is finish the stinking game. Stop adding things, just finish it. In the meantime, Cloud Imperium Games seems to have a bad habit of a drawing attention to itself when it's kind of inappropriate with things like that Legatus package. And eventually people get in the press about, oh, look at Star Citizen, it's still not done. Kind of like we are here right now. Now, which leads to a surprisingly effective way to metaphorically spray some WD-40 on that hamster wheel they're on. Usually when all these articles come out making fun of Star Citizen for the latest stupid thing they've done, highlighting their lack of accountability, the evangelical fans get whipped into a frenzy defending it. And usually once they're in a frenzy, once they've got their crusader gear out, oh look, another ship is being sold. So now everyone is primed to buy that ship. They get some more development time, eventually something happens happens that gets them in the news again and the hamster wheel gets another shot of grease. And just one last thing that's kind of related to the next topic but we'll still talk about in this topic. No one cares that no profits are currently being made on Star Citizen, especially considering that just because there are no profits doesn't mean that salaries and bonuses aren't getting paid. And while I'm not exactly saying that they're lining their pockets here, I don't think that Chris Roberts and co are getting California minimum wage to work on this game. Remember that tens of millions of dollars are getting paid to CIG's coffers every year and a large part of development costs is paying the developers. There's the issue of Star Citizen not having necessarily shady, but certainly questionable business practices when it comes to making the game. We've already talked about quite a few things that can be considered questionable business practices, but there's a good number of other things I'm gonna bring to your attention, as well as things that we've covered earlier that I'm gonna tell you more about. For instance, we already talked quite a bit about Squadron 42, and it's an example of really just, uh, what were you thinking there? With the preceding caveat of just about everything in Squadron 42 development could have been considered acceptable in moderation. However, that's not the case as everything seems to be taken up to 11 before it's even halfway done. And on top of that, everything seems to be done in what might be the worst order possible to do it. We talked about earlier how the issue of using A-list talent is a thing because that costs a lot of money. And this gets further exacerbated by the fact that they did that years ago and they're still working on Squadron 42. And while I know Squadron 42 has been heavily subject to various delays and what have you, and I don't think anyone's actually touched it and lived to tell the tale, uh, 
that's gonna be a problem because as your feature creep gets worse and worse, you're gonna wanna add those features into Squadron 42 so it doesn't look weird and lopsided. And then additionally, you're gonna have to call those A-list actors back in to do more voice dialogue or possibly reshoots as you need to reshape the story in order to make the game more fun and less of a walking simulator that lets you fly around in a spaceship. And that's gonna cost more boatloads of money. Usually, from my understanding, the very last thing you do is story and voice acting when you're making a game. But because of the way things keep on getting delayed and delayed and delayed, uh, well, I guess reshoots might be an inevitability and that's gonna be another huge chunk of change out of CIG's pocket. Another strange choice in operation is the division of the corporate offices making the game. Star Citizen has five different studios in three different countries, two in the US, two in the UK, and one in Germany. And while I can see the benefit of tax incentives, like the ones in the UK that led to that hubbub about the loan, I have to ask myself, would that really make sense? Well, I get that you're getting a good amount of tax incentive, but if the tax incentive is that good, why not just have all the business there? Additionally, that's it's gonna be, let's see, it was California, Texas, UK, Germany. That's four different time zones that you need to sync up in order to have any sort of effective board meeting between all the heads of development. And also that's five different sets of corporate law that you need to adhere to, counting the fact that Star Citizen is primarily registered in Delaware. We get Delaware, California, Texas, the UK, and Germany. So the question becomes again, does this division, does all this tax incentive cover for the logistical trouble this brings on, and in addition, the additional sets of rules that everything needs to be constrained to? And again, that's five different sets of lights you need to keep on, five different sets of rent you need to pay, and five different sets of recruiting areas for employees, which again, I could see an effective counter argument of distributed development means that you don't need to pay money to relocate people, but additionally, there comes to be the issue that a lot of these studios are not exactly in the cheap parts of town. While doing research on the UK studios, I discovered what's called the Golden Triangle. So yeah, why, why not just go out to Scotland or st I don't know where cheap real estate in the UK is to be honest, but why are we going to the bougie parts? And then additionally, Cloud Imperium Games Studio in Los Angeles. Okay, we are a short distance from Santa Monica of the beach. Uh, I live in the cheaper part of Southern California and I'm sweating pretty hard over rent. So I can only imagine how intense it is to have an office in a very choice area that is within looking distance of Riot Games is, hey, let's pretend we're sports arena. And then when we consider the Texas studio, of course, we're in trendy, trendy Austin right now. When we consider where all these Cloud Imperium game studios are, it really seems like one of the primary features as to where they set up their bases of operations was bragging rights. Well, you could have easily, like, you could have gone to, I don't know, uh, if there's some sort of California game development instead of, you could have gone out to Riverside, like, I wouldn't have told anyone you were in Riverside. And again, I am sure there are cheap, affordable areas of the United Kingdom to set up shop. And what about for that Texas studio? Maybe instead we consider the outcroppings of Houston or possibly even if we really want to rake in those fresh out of college kids to develop your game, why not just set up right smack dab in College Station, Texas outside of Texas A&M? Like what, are we too good for the trappings of Nicholas and Riot Games in Santa Ana, California? Which, okay, let me pause for a second. Come to think of it, last time I was in Santa Ana, it is rapidly gentrifying, so I'm not sure if that area is cheap anymore, but you get the point. All all these studios seem to be in unnecessarily expensive places to operate. There's other things we can talk about too concerning the business decisions, like that loan, which again, it's not really a loan. It's an advance on their tax credits that they passed off the reason being that they don't wanna to have to convert all that cash. While there's probably a much more, I guess, informed decision coming from an absolute lay person, that seems like the big business equivalent of going to the coin star because you can't be bothered to roll your quarters. And that's really all I'm gonna say on that because I don't exactly have an MBA. I am fully open to the idea that I am entirely wrong about about my thoughts on that advance. On the other side of business decisions, things that seem productive and good, as I recently found out, which was also my first encounter with Star Citizen fans, Cloud Imperium Games UK has subdivided their shares and 
set up a new set of rules for 10% of those shares. And that could be a whole lot of things. Yes, like I initially thought that could be an idea to try and sell stock to people. But then again, I realize now that there's a million other little things that would make that potentially disastrous, but they could also be getting private investors. They could also be trying to use employee stock option as an incentive to get really good talent. What matters here that in spite of all the other blunders, it at least seems in the here and now that Cloud Imperium Games is not sitting on its hands when it comes to its future. And in the event that finally the game comes out or they've somehow managed to milk their fans dry, they have a way for paying for the servers once the game is live or other such expenses like QA team costs or making sure that the core team is allowed to stay on after the launch to keep things updated and coming out. And then lastly, because you can't really not bring it up when talking about Star Citizen business decisions, there's all the little things that I've partially talked about previously, like the very glossy YouTube channel with very glossy promos and that door they felt the need to install, which frankly, you know what? I'm sure that door didn't cost like a million dollars, but they certainly could have done a lot worse. From an outsider's perspective, that does kind of look bad, but when we try to put ourselves in the shoes of the Star Citizen development team, that's probably a good thing for employee morale. The thing about this segment is it's not bad business decisions, it's questionable business decisions. I want to make sure I'm as fair as possible, like I said earlier. Now, of all these questionable business decisions, one stands tall among the others as something that actually could sink Cloud Imperium games and ruin Star Citizen, which was the choice to switch from CryEngine over to Lumberyard, among other things, in order to continue the development of the games. Yes, I know, it later came out that CryEngine was not a good idea for the sheer size of the thing they were trying to make, but they had a contract with Crytek that stated, we're going to let you use this engine as long as you exclusively stay with us. And yes, Cloud Imperium Games tried to get that suit dismissed, but were then just made fun of in the reply to that dismissal request. And the last time I checked, they're making requests for discovery on various documents every few months or so. So this case is moving forward and we might even see it at the end of the year. So that is something to keep an eye on. And probably when something actually happens, you'll see the usual suspects uh, pouring over the court documents when they're public available because I ain't paying 50 bucks for this. Now, again, it's good that we just reiterated that I am at least trying to be fair with Cloud Imperium Games and Star Citizen, and I've put off actually talking about the game itself, or at least what is the closest thing we have to a game, and there's no way about it. It's, it's crap. Every part of the game is so just crap right now. You've had nearly six years, Cloud Imperium Games. What were you doing? It's, this game is a broken, buggy, unplayable, mess and any aspect of it like nothing really works and that's being really liberal uh, hey Yamix, what was it like the last time you played the game ah uh, okay uh, first of all not play but test because that's really what you're doing for it rather than actually playing because there's really no gameplay if you really want to count in some mini games as actual gameplay yeah your standards are lower than mine are but the last time i picked it up essentially it was very buggy performance wise it was horrible on a high-end machine and by a proper game standards barely anything worked and even then you have to drop to your knees and pray to some gods just to get favorable conditions. The last version of the game I played I believe was Alpha 2.4 which had a um, it had Crusader which was the little standalone solar system. You could fly around to different areas inside of it and they had added a, a pirate base recently. It was alright. The thing is it was hard to get into because there were so many performance issues mainly with networking because people were just lagging all over the place when I was playing it. But I don't know how much they've done on that since then, since 3.0 has come out since then, and I think as of recording this, they just made a new version today. Yeah, I just looked and they added um, 3.2, so I haven't played it in probably two years nearly, maybe exactly two years. So I do keep up with the news for it, but I haven't played the game in a while. All right, Mandalore gets a free pass on this one. Let's start with what's supposed to be the actual game that will come out. 
the Crusader module. It's been five and a half years, and this is a hardware stress test at best, if we're going by Yamek's standards of a test. Even after 3.2, unless you have access to the test server, which I was confused about since I thought I was on a test server of sorts, there's still not a whole lot to do unless they changed it again and allowed all the normies to start mining. I don't know. The Crusader's not got a whole lot going on for it unless you like animation glitches and things that would be pointless fetch quests are there if they worked. Uh, yeah, let's go out and shoot at nothing for a bit. If fetch and kill quests aren't quite your thing, you can also become a wanted criminal by accidentally parking in the red zone. Great times, right? I get that this is supposed to be a taste of what's to come, the big beautiful world they're going to create, but frankly, neither you nor myself can play coming soons or we can't play promises. So that doesn't mean a whole lot. And I had access to a couple ships. I had the Mustang and then some other sort of racy ship. And the Mustang, I don't know if it was intentional or not, but it handled awful and it broke apart easily. I got tickled and I exploded. Exploded. It's is this a tongue-in-cheek joke at the expense of the Mustang's namesakes? Is it intentionally made out of the cheapest aluminum that they can find? Does it secretly have a sentient need to go careening into the nearest crowd it can find waiting outside of an IHOP for Sunday brunch as it leaves cars and coffee? Or I guess in this case, pledges and coffee. You get the idea though. It's like, wow, this is what you have to offer me? This is what pledging money will get me? We'll talk about the rest of the stuff that's really crap about Crusader mode in a bit because they're all things that are universal to what's bad about what you can play of Star Citizen after nearly six years. Let's switch over to Citizen Marine, which I've already expressed my distaste of. And it's... I don't want to do this. You know what? Sometimes you just gotta suck it up and do the things you don't want to do in life. We gotta eat our metaphorical vegetables. I, I just want to get my hour and a half back that I spent trying to give Citizen Marine a fair shake. It's the worst multiplayer shooter I've ever played. It's utterly broken. It has no unique mechanics or anything that would set it apart from the crowd. Yes, I am aware it was outsourced and that was a blunder, but why would you pick the team that's only known for a so-so at best shooter nobody's heard about and Sonic Boom. Your experience in Citizen Marine can be best summed up as if you finally find one person to play against, or maybe even a whole team, you'll be wandering around maps that just feel way too big for the type of matches they are, and you're going to clip into things. Likely, you will have to try and capture the nodes like five or six times, where you'll become acutely aware of the fact that the animation never lines up properly, and it just looks weird. And sometimes when it doesn't line up, you'll clip right into the terminal, and you'll just be a sitting duck to get shot. By the way, the balance can be summarized as whatever is the newest gun is the best gun and don't bother with everything else. Sorry if you like rifles, but shotgun is king right now. Yes, you could say that a unique feature is the zero G things that you occasionally have to do, but I wouldn't be selling that because it's basically you just awkwardly float over to another part of the room and maybe you get a shortcut, maybe you get immediately shot as soon as you enter the gravity zone again. That's not really something interesting. And by the way, Cliffy B, Lawbreakers, congratulations. You did something better than someone else. A great way to sum up my experience and likely anyone else's experience with Citizen Marine is the following statement. If I were to have played Citizen Marine with somehow having no no knowledge of Star Citizen or in Cloud Imperium games, and you were to tell me that Citizen Marine was a byproduct of some rando going on to some engine storefront, buying the fanciest looking assets he could find, slapping them together with no regard for QA, balance, functionality, or optimization, and then subsequently slapping it on the Steam storefront for $19.99 before carpet bombing key mailer to try to get some free and easy press, I would totally believe that is the case because that is how this game feels. It feels like an asset flip gone as poorly as it could have gone. And you know what? I recant my halfway assertion about Radical Heights being a kind of sort of asset flip because unlike Citizen Marine and actual asset flips, at least Radical Heights tried. At least they tried to add new and interesting features to the game to set themselves apart from everyone else. Citizen Marine does not try in the slightest. Now penultimately, before we get to the universal things that make Star Citizen a painful experience, let's talk about what I call the odd and ends features, like the dogfighting, and the little racing thing, and the hangar module. Let's start with hangar module, which, of all the things, it feels like this one is the most well put together because it does not try to do anything super ambitious. You can walk around this big open hangar, and after 30 minutes of me swallowing my pride, googling it, you can figure out that you need to touch a 
little dot on the floor to open your menu to summon a ship, and then you can eventually poke around your ship until you figure out how the heck you get in the cockpit, and about half of an animation will play as you clip into your ship. And you can press the buttons, and you can get lots of fun lights and sounds, and you can pretend you're a space pilot. And uh, that's about it. If you want to see any other ships, you're going to have to start shelling out. I kind of get the feeling from the hangar module that it was designed at least partially in mind to attract YouTubers to it so that they can do reviews of starships poking around them and generating oodles and oodles of free press to get people pledging. And if that was something they intended to do, I have to admit they were extremely successful. Then we have the racing thing, which I kind of had fun with once I finally got the controls down, but the controls were just so wonky. I don't know if it was my ship or just they hadn't quite dialed it in yet, but I had to set my controller sensitivity to near zero, no matter what I used. And for reference, I use my mouse, a Logitech G502, a Rock Candy Xbox 360 controller, and old reliable here, a literal first generation USB joystick. You try to fly around for some hoops as fast as you can, because that's certainly not something that anyone would ever resent given previous games. And if you're feeling saucy, you can try to figure out some shortcuts at the expense of fancy maneuvering. I almost almost got through a few laps perfectly after about 20-30 minutes. The final penultimate thing we're going to talk about before the universal things about Star Citizen are the dogfighting module simulation thing, which uh, I would have loved to give a fair and honest shake, but for some reason, the menu refused to let me pull the Mustang and instead put me on the racing ship with no guns on it, no matter how many times I tried to switch it over and finalize it. And whenever I quit out, for some reason, it plopped me back onto the Citizen Marine Mode Select screen, which why would you ever send me to that page? Why would anyone be sent to that page after the evident disaster that was. And this is already getting into the universal things. All the menus in this game are hopelessly broken. You have to interact with them in that funny little way, which could have been so much better done by just swallowing your pride, not having a free look for everything you need to do, and just pressing E, pressing whatever interact key you want to use. Just don't make me have to mouse over to a thing, click it 20 or 30 times, and then eventually an elevator will work. Now how about that frame rate? You want to know what causes the frame rate to tank? Everything. Spawn in and get out of your little bed. Frame rate tanks. See another soul in this world. Frame rate tanks. Encounter NPCs. Frame rate tanks. Walk into a new room with stuff in it. Frame rate tanks. Look out a window. Frame rate tanks. Go and get your ship. Frame rate tanks. Get into your ship and take off. Frame rate tanks. Remember, I'm running this on 32 gigs of RAM and a 1080 Ti. And I followed Yamix's advice and I did what's called a RAM dump where I made sure that my RAM was running absolutely nothing else so that it was highly unlikely that something was memory leaking. I went into my processes and made sure there was no unnecessary programs running while Star Citizen was playing. I don't care if it's Alpha, Beta, Gamma, or Charlie. This game has been in development for five and a half years and this is what they have to show. Now I'm going to go through the usual list of excuses that are brought up whenever people try to criticize Star Citizen. Excuse one. It's only alpha. We cover that. Yeah, it's been alpha. It's been alpha for the time that it took to develop Fallout 4. It's been alpha for the time it took to make Half-Life 2, which by the way, that also built its own engine, so you can't use that excuse either. It's been alpha for long enough that a child that was conceived when the Kickstarter was funded is now entering the first grade. Excuse number two. No one has ever made a whole universe like Star Citizen is doing. Oh, uh, let's see now. EVE Online did it, No Man's Sky did it procedurally, Elite Dangerous was smart and just modeled it after the Milky Way, and isn't there a game literally called Universe Engine or something? Heck, Spore sort of did it with their half done end game. Come to think of it, a lot of people have done this before. They were just smart about it and didn't do it in the most inefficient way possible. Excuse 3. Star Citizen is unique because it's entirely crowdfunded and doesn't answer to anyone like the evil publishers at EA. A lot of games are unique in the crowdfunding thing, but they did the crowdfunding model properly. Let me give you a little hint as to how. It's called Kickstarter because it's supposed to act as a kickstart to the development of a project that normally wouldn't get greenlit by people that need venture capital. It's not called kick fund literally every step of the process along the way indefinitely. 
If anything, you could say it's an experiment in abusing the crowdfunding model, because frankly, as we have discussed previously, Cloud Imperium Games has no reason to really go forward as they have no one to account to, and they are not losing funds anytime soon with the way they are doing business. Excuse number four. It's gonna be great when it finally comes out. Yeah, sure. And I'm sure the release of tectonic stress in the San Andreas Fault will be pretty intense too when it happens. And when we figure out what happens in the winds of winter, I'm sure that'll be pretty cool too. But while these things are things that will evidently happen eventually, we don't know if they're going to happen in the near future or even in our lifetimes. So there's no point on banking on maybes and promises when we have nothing to show for it after a substantial period of time. I can't take maybes and future promises to the bank and I certainly can't pay my rent in well we're working on. Excuse number five. They're making the game from complete scratch though. You mean like just about how every other AAA indie and other game company has done at one point as they will need to either make or license an engine? On that note also, they did not make it from scratch because they licensed out CryEngine. That is not making it from scratch. That is starting from an engine that is well established. Now, finally, let's talk about the worst flaw that Star Citizen has that no amount of development might be able to fix. Selling ships. Well, I guess it wouldn't be a problem if those, all of those, would be some starter ships. But as soon as you allow a person to buy the biggest, baddest, most expensive ship, then please tell me what will the in-game progression actually look like once the game launches, if it ever does that. Because many games that have some sort of a feature-centric gameplay, that is, in this case, ships, tend really not to give out these uh, higher tier ships for just anyone. Otherwise, if if you're able to buy the biggest, baddest, most expensive ship in the game, even before the game has been ever released, it will not only ruin that person's gameplay to some extent, but also introduce this wonderful thing called pay to win. It's overtly pay to win. Want the fastest ships for racing? Buy them with your money. You wanna blow all those little ships that are the equivalent of used Toyota Corollas out of the sky? Well, go ahead, spend a thousand dollars or so and get yourself a frigate. Watch them all pop off like little fireworks in the sky. They can't even scratch your paint. There is effectively nothing stopping Mega Whales from owning the entire game before it even goes live. And to play devil's advocate, potentially that is something that could help keep them afloat after 1.0. Certain markets do not see pay to win as a practice that is frowned upon, and if Cloud Imperium Games really wants to sell their soul, they could effectively keep the lights on after 1.0 on whales alone. And they'd have to effectively sell off every scrap of goodwill they ever had, but they'd never be wanting for money again. You know what? I need a minute. Mandalore, can you take over for a sec? The question about ship sales is hard to answer. When I made the video two years ago, they were selling some infantry gear and ships, and I think they had like a golf cart. But now, you know, they're selling tanks, they're selling land, they're selling more items, they're selling more ships. So at this point, I would think the in-game economy would basically be, I don't want to say ruined, but people are going to start with a very, very clear advantage if they've been hoarding this stuff up over the years. Even if tomorrow they just stopped selling ships completely, it's already, you know, they made nearly $200 million selling all of it, so what can you do about it? Even recently they got in hot water for having a page that you have to spend at least $1,000 to even view, where you could buy a ship, like, compilation or something like that, it would cost nearly $30,000. And when I said, you know, they should do a website redesign, I didn't think that that meant valeting parts off like that. It was more of, you know, have your cheap stuff on the front of the store for new people to see, and if they want to see all the other stuff, you go deeper into the website to find it, but I, I don't think that's the way to do it. They could shift over to only selling cosmetics and only selling merchandise, but I don't think they're going to do it. Because the company is so big now, and there's so many people around the world working on it, they need this money to keep coming in. Which is related to the feature creep thing, because no one really knows what their budget is at right now. You know, if money stopped coming in today, would they still be able to deliver on everything? The answer is, I don't think so, but who knows for sure. And like I said, how no amount of development might be able to fix it? Well, Pandora's box is already open and it's going to be very hard to slam it shut. How are you going to balance things in a way to where it is feasible to actually get those ships with grinding alone that doesn't completely invalidate the thousands of dollars some people have spent on these ships. You can't just say, okay, if you really want, just grind for like a hundred hours and you can get your own Idris, because suddenly everyone who bought 
that ship is going to lose their mind over the fact that their purchase has been so severely devaluated. And who cares about how many crew slots these ships have outside of a few select buddies that you might bring along to your thing, which they'll have to buy ships too, unless there's some sort of subscription. Nobody really wants to be gunner number five. You wanna be the captain. That's why you play these space fantasy games. You wanna escape the fact that you're too broke to race Lambos. You don't wanna go into a fantasy world only to find out, oh yeah, I'm too broke to race whatever the Star Citizen equivalent of a Lambo is. I guess I'll just have to like wash this one dude's Lambo. I could do that in the real world, thank you very much. Oh boy. I initially wasn't going to talk about this part, but after getting a look for myself and having my own run-in with the Star Citizen fanbase, I realize now that the SC fanbase and some of its more extreme members are one of the biggest obstacles in the way of Cloud Imperium Gaming when it comes to making Star Citizen a success. Now to just immediately get this part out of the way, I'm not going to grovel to the whole not all Star Citizen things, and I'm going to say it's more like a ratio of Dark Souls characters for friendly, helpful, constructive people to angry folks that just want to shout down anything that is not absolute praise, which is say, you might find maybe a dozen people and entities in your typical Dark Souls game that are friendly and want to help you out and don't immediately try to kill you. However, nearly every other entity in that world is going to want to see you dead for the thousandth time. Now, I would be missed if I did not say that I had some friendly Star Citizen fans and people who are otherwise skeptic of CIG's development process right now, who did end up being a big help in the production of this video. But again, I am going to reiterate, it really feels like from my experiences and the experiences of others that I have tapped in order to make this video, that the Star Citizen fan base is overwhelmingly hostile to anything that is not absolute praise of the game and its developers. What made me initially decide to include the Star Citizen fan base, aka the Cult of Roberts, in this game is my own experience with them, coupled with all the warnings I had about interacting with them before I did so. I was really excited to make that video about the subdivision of shares. I thought it was actually a really cool thing that CIG was doing in an attempt to go public. And yes, while I did learn a lot about how there's a lot of other things they could do, as soon as I got into any major Star Citizen area, like the subreddit, I was in immediately set upon. It was intense, which I also learned from Yamix that that is a common thing. Anything that is not absolute praise of this game gets shouted down. And the interesting thing was that after they were all done shouting me down, they all started shouting each other down. It was insane. It's like they're so hostile, they're hostile to themselves too. At least according to the Yamix, I was the most soft-spoken, friendly, and caring he had ever heard me in that previous video, which I guess is something something to note. But immediately after posting it in my theory, which I admit I was going in excited for, hey, look at this cool thing I found. This could be a really interesting change of events. I was immediately shouted down. And on top of that, it really feels like of all the places, YouTube comments are the safest place to discuss Star Citizen and any sort of skepticism or not absolute praise. This makes it alarmingly evident that the primary problem with the fan base and how it might affect the devs is that anything that is not absolute praise gets shouted down and treated as an enemy. There are no neutrals. There are no slightly dissenting people that we can turn around. Now, I know that my one personal experience and the things that I have immediately perceived are only anecdotes. However, when we combine them with the anecdotes of others and many other incidents that have happened over the last six years, like Karl Marx being the one guy that insisted on having forms of assault I can't really talk about without getting demonetized in this video, we get data when we combine all those anecdotes. As a content creator who has made videos for Star Citizen, describe your resulting encounters with the Star Citizen fan base after making your videos. <laughs> Oh boy, is that a wonderful and all accepting fan base? Oh my. Well, with any sort of a fan base and a group of people, there are always some people that are extremely helpful and all that, which is always nice, of course. But as it happens over time and time again, it has been proven to me that my first interaction with the fan base has persisted throughout all of this time. Either you're gonna get a snarky comment or get looked down upon because you don't know the stuff, or even better, if you're not saying anything positive about the project, you must be a hater. The rabid cult-like mentality is very common and 
that's sort of a weird thing. But then again, it does represent something that, uh, well, happened before with No Man's Sky. And, well, we know how No Man's Sky ended up, huh? So I wonder, what will happen with Star Citizen when it either fails or comes out? And it's not the thing that the fans expected. The reaction to my Star Citizen video was basically why I'm in a YouTube network now. I ended up joining one because there's really no way to talk to YouTube through YouTube unless you get really up there, and I wasn't up there when I made the video. And I had multiple people trying to take it down for reasons ranging from terrorism to copyrighted content to all these false claims on it, and I had no way of dealing with it. As you can expect, there are a lot of insulting comments, which are still in the video, but I got some messages as well, some death threats, things like that, but I didn't take it too seriously. I knew what to expect when talking about the game, and it ended up going just about how I thought it would, which I guess is alright. Basically, if you have negative things to say about Star Citizen, you should expect a mountain of shit being thrown your way. Depending on your tone, it might be a smaller pile, but you're gonna get stuff thrown at you no matter what. There was also more constructive feedback, a lot of construction, and some overall positive comments about it, but yeah, you're gonna have that negative element there for sure. As I said before though, it is to be expected. When someone has invested a ton of money into the game, they're gonna be a lot more vocal in defending it. You know, you see people fighting about console wars or video games, that's, you know, maybe $60 or a few hundred dollars. With Star Citizen, you might have someone who's putting thousands of dollars into it and they will jump at the chance to defend it and say, everything's going fine, I didn't waste my money. So it could be a sunk cost fallacy thing like that, or maybe everybody's crazy. I don't know, maybe I'm crazy. Data that becomes ink that does not paint a very pretty picture of the culture that Star Citizen has cultivated over the last six years. Okay, real quick, I'm really sorry if there's a bunch of random pops and stuff in this particular part of the audio, but this was something I recorded last minute after a uh, catastrophic microphone failure, and this is a replacement mic that I'm using to uh, try and hold me over. Thank you so much, Patreon people, for allowing me to be able to just run out and get like an emergency hold me over mic. Something I've seen frequently brought up, almost as if invoking its name will absolve rabid fans of any sort of wrongdoing they've done in the name of defending Star Citizen, is the FUD and the Goon FUD, which in turn stand for fear, uncertainty, doubt, and the fact that the goons, or the something awful, I guess, forum base, has some sort of secret cabal to destroy Star Citizen. And I have an account from way back in the day, I went and looked at all the threads, and I see a lot of making fun of, I see a lot of trolling, I see a lot of drama posting, but I don't see anything that really attributes to the kind of boogeyman that the Star Citizen fanbase treats this as. Now, there was one person that kind of led credence to the idea of a FUD campaign, but after looking through this person's background and everything they've done and everything that's done to them, I'm not touching that with a 10-foot pole because landing any sort of credence to it by acknowledging it could be an act of FUD in and of itself, and that is not what I am here to do. I'm here to analyze. Now, as for Cloud Imperium Games acting in a way that's complicit and sometimes even enabling of this rabid, angry fan base, I'm not going to get too much into it because most of the stuff that's verifiable and readily available is just drama or stupid things that really, while it doesn't make them look like model citizens, it doesn't make them look bad. And additionally, the only sources otherwise about corporate culture inside a Star Citizen are extremely sketchy at best. Like, you all know the one I'm talking about, the Escapist article that someone put out detailing a bunch of like horrifying experiences at Cloud Imperium Games that eventually Chris Roberts popped off on and initially I thought he was just popping off on it but after seeing the context of this article and other articles like picking apart what happened in this article I have to say well maybe that wasn't the best initial response I think Chris Roberts was very right to be angry and uh, Ortwin Thurmuff pretty much did his job there and did it well. And now everything we've talked about comes down to this. The poor development, the questionable business decisions, the rabbit fan base, everything the loss of focus, the feature creep, it all comes down to does Star Citizen and Squadron 42 have a reasonable chance to come out to the full extent that was initially promised? And unfortunately, I have to say no. I really, 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 really want to be wrong about this. I will gladly eat every last feather of crow if Star Citizen somehow comes out and becomes this insanely huge mega game that we haven't seen so phenomenal since World of Warcraft and its peak, but Frankly, given all the evidence, I have no reason to believe that. In fact, I have three ways I think this is going to go down. The first route that I see Star Citizen and Cloud Imperium games taking is what I call the 
Firefall route. I see a lot of similarities between the tumultuous development of Firefall and Red 5's story of development and Star Citizen and Cloud Imperium games. Both were given boatloads of money, was little to no strings attached, and were headed up by developers who had cult followings from their previous games, but there was no oversight from any higher ups. Both games took much longer than expected to reach the release date, and in Star Citizen's case, they still haven't been released yet to the point where time sort of passed them by. And based on this, I think that there is a realistic chance that Star Citizen might go the way of Firefall, which is to say that like Firefall, Star Citizen might eventually reach a point where a lot of things are added and then cut out, and eventually the game gets kind of stable, and then to almost no fanfare, it gets launched as the final game. There's a bit of celebration, but when you look at what the final game became compared to what was in beta for God knows how long, really not much was changed. Then, just like Firefall, Star Citizen becomes subject to very many mediocre reviews pointing out the fact that we waited so long for this, and the development team at Cloud Imperium Games subsequently implodes. J beyond just the normal, like, okay, we don't need you guys anymore because we're in the maintenance phase of games, but it genuinely implodes. The culling of staff is much larger than it should have been to keep down with costs, as they can't exactly rely on great press to drive sales, and again, much like Firefall, Firefall will probably get more than a handful of manifestos posted anonymously detailing all the crazy stuff that happened during development, which we've already seen a couple people come out and write about their experiences working on Star Citizen. None of them have been like overtly verifiable and gained traction, but I would not be surprised in the slightest if after Star Citizen follows this route, we get a bunch of tell-all stories. Fast forward maybe one or two years of very mediocre sales as the game never got traction past the funding point for their development and Star Citizen servers shut down. It's a shame and come 2030, no one even remembers the name Star Citizen. Now, the second route this can all take is what I call the Gaming Mysteries route, which if you don't know who Yuri of Wind is, I would highly recommend his Gaming mystery series. I enjoy it very much. In this route, one thing or another happens, whether it be an implosion of the staff because of a walkout for some reason, I don't know why that would happen, or they actually do run out of funding and the development gets canceled before we see any of the final version of Star Citizen or Squadron 42. And for whatever reason, it all gets lost into the ether. Fast forward maybe three, four, five years, and then someone like, say, Yuri of Wind, who has his Gaming Mystery series, or the Unseen 64 group, working with Did You Know Gaming, perhaps, finds a way to dig up what was never seen of Squadron 42 and the most advanced build of Star Citizen. And that's how we get the namesake of this route. Basically, it gets lost, and then years later, after all the hubbub has died down and everyone's calmed down, it gets brought up again as we find what was never given to us. It'll probably be disappointing this way too. I, I really, I don't like this way. I feel like this would be the most disappointing way for it all to go down. The final possibility I see for Star Citizen is what I'm calling the history repeats itself route. Basically, Chris Roberts realizes at one point that, oh no, we're not getting enough money anymore, or oh no, maybe we're not able to do this. And in the interest of making sure that Star Citizen sees the light of day and making sure that he can be true to his word and deliver the best possible product to his backers, he decides, you know what, I hate myself for doing this, but I'm going to have to sell the game off to EA or Microsoft or someone who will subsequently take over the game, get it shipped, and then we'll have Star Citizen. I don't know, maybe in 2025. This route, I think, is best case scenario. It sucks, but it's best case scenario. And this one, Chris Roberts never has to worry about never making the game. The game gets made. It's not made on his terms, but it gets made and the people get to play it in an acceptable condition. And there's going to be the what ifs for the rest of time. Like, oh, what if we were able to make it ourselves without corporate restriction? But that's going to be, again, what if. Let's hear from our other co-creators about what they think is going to happen with Star Citizen in the end. I pose two questions to both the Yamix and Mandalore Gaming. The first one being, do you have faith in Cloud Imperium games and their abilities to develop Star Citizen? And when do you think Star Citizen is going to come out in its final release version? I do think with unlimited time and unlimited budget, they could make the Star Citizen people are hoping for, but I don't think it'll be the release version. Chris Roberts himself said he doesn't know what the release version will be, so there's no telling what's actually going to be in it when they say Star Citizen 1.0 is done, here it is. 
since everything on their stretch goals and everything, even in the base, the base game features, that could just be later down the line. So I have no idea because I don't know what Star Citizen is anymore. This kind of folds into the other question of when do I think it'll be out? Well, I have no idea. Chris Roberts might decide that 1.0 might be a very bare bones thing that has, you know, a few, a handful of systems and maybe, you know, mining, fighting, trading, and some really basic stuff and says either stuff will come later. Or he might bet everything on the 1.0 version, so it might not come out for years and years and years, but it'll have a lot of stuff in it. <laughs> like I said before, who knows anymore? Faith? No. And yet, if Star Citizen fails completely and goes bankrupt, well, it will leave a massive impact, both on gaming and on crowdfunding. And that has to be the dumbest situation you can be in. But in general, due to avarice and feature creep, or just an excuse to continue crowdfunding this project, I highly doubt they are very interested in finishing the thing, and rather just raking in money just to see how far they can go. And the funniest thing is, I wouldn't have said something like this if it wasn't for the long development time. And so before long, who knows, maybe even the company might be in hands of EA by the time it comes out. If it ever does. So am I rooting for Star Citizen's failure? No, but not because I believe in the project. That belief was shattered immediately as I picked it up and tested it for the first time. 2018 is still scheduled for Alpha, 2019, beginning of it at least, is still scheduled for Alpha, so presumably the whole year is Alpha. At best on 2020 sometime, maybe probably in the end of it, it might see Beta somewhere. Then that will last for at least one year as well, if not even longer. 2022, it might start seeing some release notes, and then... 2023 it might actually come out and mind you i'm not accounting for extra time in alpha feature creep and all the other little things that may come along so that might be the fastest now in spite of everything i've said and in spite of all the information presented here, I do not believe in the slightest that Star Citizen is a scam. I merely believe that the Roberts brothers are just so far over their head that they have no idea how to proceed and they have no one to give them direction on how to finish this game. And in spite of this big old, this is what I'm calling it prophecy, it's not really a prophecy unless you leave in a little clause to tell people how to get out of this doom and gloom. So in the event, that Chris Roberts is watching this, I am going to give you my charlatan recommendation. Depose yourself as CEO of Cloud Imperium Games. Keep your controlling stake, but maybe use those 100,000 shares to entice outside help to become your new CEO. And I know you're going to hate my suggestion, but go get somebody from EA Games. Better yet, go get somebody that's an executive from a big bank, one of those heartless dudes that'll foreclose on a family's house without flinching. Cause that's the dude you need. You are not that kind of dude, but you need him so bad right now. You need the kind of guy whose suits cost more than your typical service industry employee vehicle and whose hair is so immaculately gelled up and slicked back that you could bounce a quarter off that thing. You need a dude that makes people like Paul Ryan and Jack Donaghy look like filthy hippies. Why do you need this person? Because this is the person that's going to rein it in and to keep you on track to get this game out. You need a person who's going to look at your employees who you have bonded with and grown close to and tell them with spittle flying out of their mouth and anger that part of their job is to get all these things done according to deadline and if they cannot do their job you will give them 15 minutes to collect their things from their desk while security is getting over here to escort them out of the building this is the kind of person that will bring the restraint into cloud imperium games that it so desperately needs right now the person that's going to say no we cannot add a shooter module we're not even making a shooter game what are you talking about that is millions of dollars that we would waste this is the person that will get star citizen out on time this is the kind of person that will make sure that Squadron 42 gets to be as cool as a game as it can be, but that it will come out and all budgets and deadlines will be respected. This might work, and I seriously doubt that anyone who has the ability to do such a thing inside of Cloud Imperium Games is actually listening to this, but I fulfilled my duty of having the loophole in my little prophecy. So thanks. Wow. 
Wow, it's this is way bigger than I ever thought it was. Thank you so much for joining me. This is an unbelievable project. I did not realize it was going to get this big. I'd like to especially thank the Yamix and Mandalore Gaming for helping me out during this video. And I'd like to thank all of you for somehow sitting through all this, even if it took you like a week to get through the entire video. Now, as you see here, I don't have Frisk, the usual outro kitty, because I made some new friends when I went up to Northern California for a bit, as a litter of kittens was delivering under the cabin we rented. And these guys look about three, four months old, and you don't have to worry about them. They seem to be a natural part of the ecosystem here, as we did not see a single rat. And also the owners of the cabin were frequently putting out kibble and stuff for them. And don't you worry, we saw Mama Cat frequently. She was usually watching from afar on the roof of the garage. Now, if you'd like to help me out, feel free to subscribe, like the video, share it, even share it on like Star Citizen forums, like... I kind of dare you at this point. Like, I'm expecting to get a lot of hate mail for this, but I'll be fine. Don't you worry. And please, please, please consider pledging to my Patreon, as I find I am much more fruitful than Starship pledges. So enjoy the credits, enjoy the kitties, and I'm going to see if I can't get this, like, I don't know, recognized somewhere, because this is actually feature length now, I think. So uh, I'll see you next time. I'm hoping the next video is nowhere near this long. You guys need some more water? Near me? Oh, I see you poking your head out. Oh, that water is a little low. Kind of hard for you to reach it. Definitely going to have to do something about that. Got another taker. What time is it? Yeah. All right. Bye bye, kitties. Frisk, Frisk, calm down. I just, we're just trying to sort the coins here so we can get this done. Cat. Frisk, please. You already smacked Meow. over my dime piles earlier. Why do you hate the coins? Meow. Why do you hate coins? Why do coins freak you out? Meow. Baby boy, do you want squeeze? <laughs> what is that face? Meow. Why are you so... Is it because... Oh, I know what it is. We had to put your fat butt on a diet and how did you trash this so much? So now you're not going to let me sort my coins. Particularly the dimes that you seem to hate. Or are you just trying to be a kitty dragon? Like sit on a pile of coins. Baby boy, just let me... <laughs> Jesus. I've thrown all your toys. I let you have the string over there, the shoelace, that I have no idea why we had it. Ow! Ow! Cat, what is your deal? Do we have to take you to the other room? So that I can sort my coins in peace? I just want to sort these dimes, put them into rows, I can do and then put them in the sleeves so we can take them to the bank. Oh, I know what you want. We'll take one of these and crumple them up. Oh, and now I have your attention. Oh yes, oh yes, now we have what you're after. Oh, that's an excited boy. He just wanted to play fetch. Oh no, did you lose it to my smelly shoes? <laughs>